equivalent of toward me on the marver is that way. So I start the twist with the with the um, marver. Make it keep it round by doing that. Twist in place, marver in place to twist it. And after I do that, I marver level and barely blow to make it perfectly round. Now to make the cup, it's kind of backward from the usual way of blowing. The tip of this bubble is going to become the rim. The part nearest the blowpipe is going to be the bottom of the cup and it's going to have a hole in it. I want to make the twist as tight as I can. Now I'm going to grab it and pull a little. Twist it tighter while I pull. Blow a little and make a neck down here. There are easier places to make a neck, I'll tell you that. This always takes a struggle. Thank you, Ross. a reasonable neck down at the bottom that should break fairly easily. Oh, that sounds kind of not too convincing. I'm going to make it a little, a little tighter. Last thing you want to go do is got all this trouble and then have it break badly. Now I'm going to put a neck up near the bloat up near the end, just like I would for a blown foot. Okay, sorry. Y'all are kind of close. Open the hole to about an inch and a half. Now I leave the blow hose on because I'm going to Sofietta and the traditionally in Venice when they do this they have somebody hold their hand on the end of the pipe now we want this thing cylindrical so I'm going to get rid of that taper that I've got going there
final opening. Now to get the best bubbles, you know, at the intersection of every four canes, four canes, there should be nice bubbles. To do that, I'm going to soften the entire thing and press from the outside with the jacks. That way the roughness will be pushed to the inside. The grooves will wind up more on the inside than the outside and I'll have a better chance of trapping nice bubbles that way. I have to preheat my pincers to hold this thing and put it in the cup holder. Now this is going to go on hold in that pickup box. So I'll bite the neck and put it upright in the cup holder. That will idle at about 9.50 until I'm ready for it later on. All right. Okay, so we have, a, we have a pretty varied menu. So I've just made the cup for the reticello. I think we'll do the reticello last. Excuse me, Mary Jo. We'll do the reticello last. Before that, uh, I want to show you... So we have this list of requests that you've made over the last few days and I want to knock off a few of those requests. So the top one there is a folded colored vessel. Well, in here are a couple of pots. One is blue glass, one is green. So I'm going to make a Roman style late first century bowl that um, will be green. So I'll take an initial gather of green on the end of the blowpipe. We'll also be doing the, a dragon stem goblet. We'll be doing uh, what we call the Saint Augustine Rouen goblet, this very beautiful, very interesting 12th, 13th century thin, thin stemmed goblet. And maybe a couple of other things. We'll see how the time goes. There's a little bit of green glass. I'm not even going to try to blow a bubble in it. I have found over the years that if I try to blow a bubble in it at this stage, about, oh, I don't know, one out of ten times I get a bad blowout. If I gather over it, marve or do the normal procedure and just ignore the color, I get a higher percentage of good blowouts. Of course, because you're all watching, it'll blow out badly. Bruce, Bruce, I need you, no rush whatsoever, but I need you to transfer those canes onto that plate. Okay. You might wait 15 or 20 minutes until the plate cools off a little. It will be hot, but wait a few minutes. Now the thing I do, I just ignore the color. I pretend that it's not even there and use normal procedures Give that a little reheat.
Now I'll do the standard setup. Now I start to blow at a very medium, moderate pressure. After I see a little bit of bulge, I blow a little bit harder. I can see that it is blowing out nicely and evenly, so I'm safe to blow it on up a little bigger. I'll use the blow squish blow method. It's just like blow yank blow except you push in instead of yanking. Squish Blow, start the neck. Make a beautiful neck with a tapered shoulder that will break cleanly and easily. You never want a mediocre, never settle for a mediocre neck. Now I'm going to take the blow hose off and heat the end of this and hold it down and maybe spin to make it a little, a little bit pointed. This is in preparation for making what we call the Roman foot. This is one of those configurations that the clever Roman glass blowers came up with in the late first century BC. Now often it's enough to just hold it at the mouth of the furnace like this. I'll spin a little bit. In Venice they always have two yokes. They have a yoke here and they have a yoke up here. I used to have one. You can see where the screws are. I found it got in the way, but it's very handy for doing things like this. All right, now, a little more preparation before the Roman foot. what's going to happen is I'm going to make a constriction, I'm going to push flat, I'm going to hold the constriction, then suck in, and the floor of the bubble will move upward and touch the constriction. And that's the, that's the thing that results in that ring of air in a Roman foot. Most of them have a ring of air. Here goes, constriction, push flat, I squeeze either side and now I hold and suck in, blow, and that is a Roman foot. Now I'm going to force cool the bottom. When you do that, it always makes a not very attractive area right here. 
so you reheat it and reshape that. Blow a little, hold it up. I push in to the left and blow. Just gives it a nicer profile in the lower part of the vessel. The bottom pooched out a little bit, so I'm gonna push that back in. And now I'm ready to transfer it to the punty. The way I do punties is always dependent on cooling the punty site with a long, soft blow. Transfer to the punty. I make the end of the punty flat. Blow hard. Break the neck. is a little crooked, I'll just push it down onto center. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit and use the Sofietta. The Sofietta is a tool that I believe originates in the medieval period and we're here in the late first century BC or early first century AD. And I can do this without the Sofietta. Believe me, I can do it without the Sofietta. But it's going to be prettier. It's going to be easier and prettier and quicker if I use the Sofietta. So what I'm going to do is open the hole to about an inch and a half. When you have a large diameter piece, you can open the hole bigger. Open it to about an inch and a half, reheat the entire thing, and reshape it. inch and a half, maybe even two inches wouldn't hurt. This is what I call the flying Sofietta. It's really nice to be able to stand and do it because normally gravity is just trying to knock the thing off center. But here gravity can actually be part of the shaping and help. So here goes. I started horizontally, but watch. The Flying Sofietta. Olga likes that. The fold can either be an outer fold or an inner fold. I'll do an inner fold. So when I sit down, I'm going to take the tips of the blades and fold the edge inward and then upward. And then I'll do the final shaping. There's the fold. Now to make sure it's closed, to make sure the edge touched the inside of the bowl, I'm going to do that. If it loosens, if it comes off, it's a disaster. I mean, it's not a disaster like an earthquake, but when you finish opening it, there'll be a really nasty gap. And these look very much like the forms of 16th century Ming porcelain, for example. What we call in this country revere bowls. And that's about it. So that's a Roman foot and a folded edge. Here we go. That goes into the annealing oven. Now to skip about 1,100, 1,200 years. Let me 
come over. Oh, don't drop those. Don't drop those. Okay. So this is a really interesting goblet. This was found in a church in Rouen, France, when the church was being demolished in the late 40s after it had been badly bombed in World War II. It's, um, um, it's about this tall. I don't know whether I said 11th or 12th century. I should have said 14th century. Anyway, the stem is about two millimeters in diameter. So what I've done to save time, I've uh, made the cup. It's on hold in here at 950. And what I'm gonna do now, kind of like I did for the cup for the reticello, I'm gonna make the foot. I'm gonna punty the inside of the foot. And you'll see an amazing transformation of a glue bit. Turn that up to 950, it was at 920. 950 is the magic number for this glass and this furnace Uh, at which you can leave something in there all day and it won't slump. But when you pick up the foot, for example, and stick it in the 2,000 degree furnace, it won't crack. Now, if it's nine for this thermocouple and this furnace and this glass and the position of the thermocouple, you know, the phases of the moon and everything else, if it's 952, if you leave a foot in there for a couple of hours, the edge will slump. So it really is 950 plus or minus one degree. Every thermocouple is different and every controller is different, so it's not an absolute number, but under these circumstances, for me, it is. Now this goes into the 12 rib dip mold. I'm gonna go right there. Where the ribs of the cup are straight, the ribs of the foot are twisted. So I'm going to twist that. And this is a little confusing. This is going to be the edge of the foot, this constriction. And this is going to be the apex of the foot, the upper shoulder just like the reticello cup. I'm gonna leave the blow hose on because I'll use the Sofietta again. I'll open this hole to an inch. And after a reheat, use the Sofietta. Now I'm ready for the final opening of the foot. Give that a little bit more heat. Brief reheats do the least damage to optic molding patterns. So when I have optic molding, I tend to reheat very frequently, very briefly. That helps keep the ribs nice and sharp. The foot of this goblet is, is big. So apparently there was a tradition in the, in the location where this was made, um, in the period that it was made. There was a tradition of the stonemasons who built churches putting a niche in the wall, putting a glass of wine in 
and walling it up. And that's what was discovered miraculously in the late 40s in this church. And the goblet is, it's, I think it, the foot has a chip in it that's been restored, but otherwise it's intact. And it is arguably the prettiest thing in all medieval glass, late medieval. Now the punty for a shaped foot like this with a big tall apex, a big tall foot, I blew on the edge of the foot and the foot is touching not up in the very top, but near the top. Uh-oh, that's not good. I'm going to redo that. I think I overdid the blowing a little bit. So the idea is that the punty is broad and it doesn't go up in that crevice. It gets stuck on the sides. I'm going to let the punty stabilize a little bit. The cup is right there, so when I put the glue bit on here, I'm going to open the door. I'm going to open the door, touch the glue bit down, and then gradually begin to pull out the stem. I don't need this. That's just asking for trouble. Also, I might have to touch the foot, so I don't want to crack it, so I'm going to preheat the tips of the pincers. That looks good. So there's a teeny bit of color in the punty. It's stiff, though. So now I put these right here. Here comes the glue bit that becomes the stem. I like to melt it in a little bit. It makes a prettier join. And here goes. Now it's staying soft so long because of course it's in a 950 degree environment, but soon it will stiffen up. Ooh, step back. And there it is. There is, really isn't anything else to do to it. You can't reheat it, so it goes into the annealer. And I'm happy to say that even though it sounded bad, the punty broke nicely and it's, a, it's intact, as you'll see later. So now to the dragon stem goblet. We have in here the cup and the foot. You probably saw those. I'm going to make the body of the dragon and then use two glue bits to stick them all together. I need two punties for this because uh, the way I assemble it requires that the final punty be inside the bowl. So I have to have two punties. This is to de-wax the pincers. 
This is my three-in-one tool. It's got a sharp blade there, pincers, and flattening tool. Very useful. So there are my two punties. I need two rods for bits. The body of the dragon is going to have two colors. I'm going to do an underlay of white. So I have white powder here. It's white frit, rather. I'll do that a couple of times. After this hardens, I'm going to gather a little bit, a teeny bit of clear over it, and then roll it in uh, K21 green. It's much prettier to have the transparent color backed by the white. And this is, by the way, a, an ancient process. Egyptians did this when they were pulling canes. Greek and Roman Hellenist, Greek and Hellenistic Roman glass workers would usually back a transparent color with opaque white to make it more brilliant. I'm going to gather out of here because this is this furnace holds a thousand pounds of glass, and uh, my furnace only holds about sixty. So. I don't want to use it up. Again, this is going to be the body of the dragon. I'm going to strip off some of that excess. because it's too hot. Next I go in the dip hole and then make the body of the dragon right there at the bench.
Renaissance, all the bit work was trimmed from its gathering iron by casting off like this. There are no, no shear marks in Renaissance Venetian glass. Later, Venetian glass blowers start using the shears to s separate the gathering iron from its bits. But early on, that was not done. So you see cast off marks all over the place. off this punty and put a glue bit where this punty is and pick up the foot. I just want to make sure 
make sure it's all aligned nicely. And the tops of the wings are in the way I can't pass this bit off. So I put it on from above. Just confirm that this is 950. Yep. say to myself the part I want to pick up. This one time I picked up the foot on the top of the thing. I have an upside down drag and snip probably. There might be a market for that. I'll squeeze the glue bit to cool it. And I'll flash this four or five times just to try to get everything same temperature. Everything about a thousand Fahrenheit. It's uh, nicely aligned, so I just want to make sure it's stiff. In Venice, they put a punty in here with it moving. I'm not that good. So I like to have it stiff before I punty it. that it's stiff now. Just wait and see how much it distorts. That's fine. Flash for the bottom of the dragon. Transfer to the second the punty. I ever drip water on a pot tea. I really want that one to come off and not that one. So the water ensures that that's the one that'll break.
it's 11 till 12. We don't have time for the Raticello, but we have time for something much more important, and that is an optic tumbler dipped <laughs> onto the octagonal mode. Yeah. Way harder than, it's way harder, and it's much more important that you be able to do this easily than to be able to do Raticello, Ragged Goblin, all that stuff is like, they're like little card tricks or like little, little parlor games. The hard part is the trick. I see doubt in your faces. Anyway, the hard part is the glass blowing. The hardest part of that Dragon Goblin, absolutely, no kidding, was the cup. Everything else is easier. So there's the octagonal mold. I've set the diameter. I'm going to gather. This reference diameter, I made that a teeny bit bigger, and that's just right. I have done this before. Putty goes in in anticipation of my needing it. it takes about 30 45 seconds for the putty to get hot. Flatten the bottom. The blow hose allows me to blow a little bit while flattening so I get a beautiful small radius edge there. It's a little too big. I'm going to re-soften that make it a little smaller. And that should do it. It's a little bit crooked. 
There we go. Lift wrap. You can do the couple of turns. And it's a safe way to do it. If you do two or three turns, you won't see the start to point. If you do one wrap, you'll see where it sticks and then you pull it and then you'll get a you'll get one side with a bubble on it. Much better to go around a few times. Process. I heat the edge and open it to an inch. It wasn't quite hot enough. Again, I've got optic dip, optic ribs, so to do the least damage to them, I'm going to reheat really briefly, many times. There's the opening to an inch. I inflate the entire upper half to uh, make it cylindrical. And uh, to inflate the entire upper half, I have to heat the entire upper half. So I need kind of deep. Again, the flying Sofietta, very useful. And I could keep this open it from here, but I'll get a much prettier edge if I open it significantly more and immediately use the Sofietta. The Sofiata is a shaping tool. It's um, always a mistake to think of it as a tool used to blow the glass thinner. There is a company thinning when you use it. So the purpose is to change the shape of the vessel. And the purpose of doing that is to make this next step, the final opening, easy. Especially when you have tissue thin and glass. And here goes. There's the final opening. And I'll get the whole thing slightly soft. Use the heat treatment. And I'm going to lower it onto this mold next.